it. Um, we're going to take a look at a very data-driven view of what's happening within financial services. Kind of Jamie Dimon sounded the alarm recently that Silicon Valley is coming, um, and so we sort of are going to use that as a as a bit of a jump-off point throughout the presentation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with CB Insights, let me give you a little bit of background. I think this will help inform a lot of what we're doing. So um, having worked in venture and M&A before, was always disappointed with sort of the private company offerings that we had to use. Started building, I guess, what was the equivalent of Bloomberg for private companies. And over time, we've become more of a predictive analytics company. So we use data science and machine learning to help customers predict what their next investment is, their next M&A opportunity, the next market they should go out after um, or even what the next move of their competitor is. Um, we are fortunate to have a lot of really great companies as customers, Cisco, Salesforce, Castrol, Gartner, and a whole host of leading VCs as well. So I will uh, just kind of give you that as context, a lot of happy customers. Um, so this is going to be the mantra of this presentation. We are uh, firm believers in this phrase of in God we trust, all others must bring data. So what we see, especially when it comes to the analysis and assessment of emerging industries or emerging companies, it tends to be very anecdote driven. It tends to be very pundit driven. Um, we think probability is the way to go. Um, and so what you're gonna see throughout this presentation is sort of our probabilistic view of where the world is going, um, and so it's heavy, heavy uh, on the reliance of data. In the next 35 to 45 minutes, and that range is really driven by Q&A, uh, we're going to cover these four main topics. One, uh, we'll start with just kind of how hot and crowded the fintech space is overall. Um, so we'll look at financing and exit trends in fintech. Then, uh, because fintech is a bit of an amorphous kind of thematic term, we'll look at sort of specific areas within fintech that seem to have momentum, and then also some of the companies uh, within uh, the space that have traction. Uh, we'll also then look at some case studies. So where are some of your incumbents placing bets? Um, I think most of the audience today is from large financial services firms. We wanted to take a look at where the likes of Goldman or JPM or Amex, Visa and MasterCard are placing their bets. And we'll kind of harp on this idea of resource allocation being strategy. Um, and so kind of what is, what is their bets in FinTech and otherwise indicate about their areas of interest and, and focus going forward. Um, and then finally, we'll just take a look at the faster pace of disruption. So I think uh, things are moving very quickly and that has implications for you as an incumbent financial services firm on what uh, it might mean for you. So uh, quickly, the hot and crowded fintech space. So this is a space that in no uncertain terms is booming. Um, in the last 12 months, we've seen almost $14 billion of funding into the space. Um, when you look at the quarterly trend, you kind of see this is a very steady uptick in both funding and uh, deal activity. Uh, Q2 of 2010 saw a billion uh, of funding, and now we're seeing nearly $3 billion in Q1 2015. So a very steady, healthy climb um, in, uh, in investment uh, into emerging fintech companies. So these are all private company investments. Um, one of the other things uh, that we'll highlight is kind of the players in this space. So before doing that, I wanted to introduce this concept because you're going to see these visualizations throughout the presentation. Um, this is a tool that we use and that we've built called the Business Social Graph. So the idea behind this network map is we let you visualize the investment, acquisition, competitor, and partner customer relationships between various players in a space. And the idea is, can we, you know, how do we help you understand an ecosystem in a dead simple way? So again, using this visualization to help you understand where there's activity and where there is not activity in a space and who might be doing what. So just to level set and make sure folks understand these visualizations that you're gonna see throughout. So. Um, just taking that business social graph in in one case, we're gonna we're looking at here is just the level of interest within fintech. So in 2010, there were 223 unique investors within the fintech space, and these are VCs only, not angels or accelerators or any of the other types of investors that we track. 
in 2015 year to date, if you just look at that business social graph, it is a incredibly more hectic and crazy looking. Um, and there are now 894 active investors. And so investors see opportunity. They see blood in this space. It's a massive industry, obviously. Um, and so they're obviously taking note of it and, and increasing their level of activity and more of them are entering the space. Um, exit activity is also climbing. So there's been some recent IPOs. It's still modest in terms of growth relative to financings. Um, financings tend to be a early indicator of, uh, of, of uh, the exit or uh, exit activity. Um, we saw some recent IPOs from Lending Club and OnDeck. And then we see uh, also Yodli, which recently exited as well. So financing and exit health is quite healthy at this point. Um, but again, fintech is more of a thematic category. So what are the areas within fintech? If we unbundle fintech a little bit, what areas are hot? What are some of the companies to watch? So let's take a look at that. Um, we're going to use a, a kind of an algorithm we've built called Market Mosaic. So this is trying to understand the attractiveness of an industry looking at data. So we're looking at um, things like sentiment and chatter in a space. So what's the press sentiment within fintech? What's just the volume of activity? What's happening in social media chatter and what's sentiment looking like? We look at factors like hiring activity. So how many open jobs are there in fintech? What's the growth of that hiring relative to other industries? So this is all on an absolute and on a relative basis. Basis. Are there key senior hires coming into the space? Um, we also, of course, look at financing activity and strength. So not just the deals in dollars and the growth in those metrics, but the quality of the investors. And we'll talk, talk about this a bit more, but investor quality, I think, is an important thing for those of you who are at financial services firms to pay attention to. So there's certain investors who are smart money. And so that's when we talk about a quality of investors, that's what we're referring to. And then the final factor is exit activity and strength. So what are the size of the exits? What's the volume? What's the pace of exits? And then again, what's the quality of the acquirers? Are these startups acquiring other startups, which is which in our model is sort of a less of a quality signal, or are these big, well-heeled companies making the acquisition? So when we combine all those factors together, you come up with kind of this score. And so FinTech, um, you see this mosaic score, the market mosaic score of 840. And... Um, this is kind of, you know, again, from our product, but what you see is kind of its score. And below that, you see some of the trending companies and top financings in the area. I think what is useful to look at is how fintech compares to other very sort of en vogue spaces like home automation or cybersecurity. And that's what you see in that orange box. So even relative to other hot areas like home automation or cybersecurity, fintech, when you look at those factors like job growth and sentiment and investor and acquirer growth and quality, we see that fintech is actually a hotter market than some of those other spaces. Um, you know, we talked a little bit, or I mentioned earlier, kind of how do we figure out, well, what's the right, what are the areas within fintech that are worth kind of following? And so I think one of the ways that uh, we see uh, folks doing this is they're tracking kind of the proverbial smart money, right? So looking at VC investment overall is interesting. It indicates that, hey, there's more activity happening, but there are a set of investors, kind of your top decile funds um, that really are good at seeing around corners. You know, these are the folks that have shown a history of betting on the right spaces and on the right company. So when we track those investors, and so we're talking about folks like Sequoia Capital or Union Square Ventures or Excel or Benchmark or NEA or Greylock, you know, what are they investing in? So this is the social graph of their top, of those top 12 investors and their fintech bets. And it's, it's obviously hard to see here. So we'll kind of distill that down. And what we see is they're placing their bets in a wide variety of areas, but here were some of the common themes amongst those top investors. Payments is obviously a very big space. You see kind of all the, the dots, which are uh, companies. Uh, personal financial management. So this, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this and some of the specific companies. So this is folks who are helping you manage your money, um, either with new tools or business models or, or technologies to do that. Lending, um, we saw earlier some of the early successes in the space uh, with regards to IPOs. Um, and then Bitcoin, which is... Um, not just Bitcoin, but I think the blockchains or the protocol that Bitcoin is built on is another area that we're seeing a lot of investment. And over to the right, by no means exhaustive, you see some of the notable investments by some of those top tier uh, VC funds and, and the companies they've invested in. So 
beyond the top tier VCs, I think one of the other interesting things that we've observed is that there's a level, a significant amount of activity from what we'd call kind of unusual suspects going after financial services. And so we're seeing everybody from Google to Intel to Salesforce investing in uh, investing in and even acquiring uh, fintech companies. And so we see here some of the some examples. Google's actually done 37 fintech deals in just the last five years. So this is not just financial services players attacking financial services players. It's actually a whole kind of cast of, of sort of a motley crew of characters that's actually entering the space. Um, it's not just U.S. tech companies either. It's global corporations that are interested in fintech. So we see the likes of SoftBank or Renren or Naspers in South Africa, Pingan Insurance also uh, making investments or acquisitions in uh, in the larger fintech space. So this is um, not a U.S. phenomena. Um, it is definitely global and it, it spans quite a few uh, diverse players who are making moves within fintech. Um, we'd put together, uh, a, I guess now a couple months ago, this periodic table of fintech and it kind of became very popular. So um, the link is at the bottom. You'll see a much more high res version of it at that site. But what we wanted to highlight was just sort of how increasingly messy and fractured and active the space was. So this is 177 of the companies, investors, acquirers, accelerators, etc. that you should know in this space. And we're going to be updating this over time So um, because the players obviously do change. Um, but what you see below in the legend is just kind of some of the different areas, everybody from lending to money transfer to digital currency to institutionally oriented fintech tools. Uh, that are, that are active and that are gaining traction in the space. So there's just a lot of activity and, and I think this is one way of, of underscoring that. So um, next, you know, we, we talked about the, the areas within FinTech that are interesting. Um, the other uh, thing to look at as we kind of unbundle this further is who are some of the companies with momentum? So again, we take an algorithmic approach to this. Private companies are incredibly opaque. Um, we're trying to make sort of these illiquid, opaque companies a little less so. So we received a few years ago money from the National Science Foundation to develop what we call Company Mosaic. It is a, and you can see the description here, quantitative framework to algorithmically analyze the health and growth potential of private companies. Companies are scored on a zero to a thousand scale. You can think of this as the new FICO score. Um, it tracks three M's for each company. We look at momentum, so things like hiring growth, executive turnover at a company level, news volume, are we seeing customer partner signings which indicate momentum, product development activity, mobile app data, web traffic. So we're pulling in a huge stream of, of disparate signals trying to track and assess the momentum of a company. We also look at the market, which I talked about earlier, market mosaic, and then finally money. So just the viability of the company, you know, from a financial strength perspective, we model burn rate, we look at financing history and investor quality. And so those three M's, um, you'll see on our product a little bit, you know, you'll see on Adyen profile, the momentum market and money score. Um, what we wanted to do was actually highlight within those verticals that the smart money was investing in uh, some of the companies that we think are notable and that have high mosaic scores. And so you see some of them here in payments. Um, what we've also done is highlighted some of the recent headlines or highlights. Uh, obviously, funding is one indication that something might be going right, but it's not by any means a foolproof signal. So we look at a variety of news related items, so everything from key hires. So you see in the case of Adyen, their hiring of somebody from PayPal, uh, Stripe, the partnership with Apple, Bill.com as well, a firm which recently launched, which has the sort of the pedigree of an ex PayPal co-founder taking aim at the credit card industry is another uh, really interesting company with a high kind of mosaic score. Uh, on the digital currency side, you see a lot here, and we'll talk a little bit about some of these companies, but, uh, you know, ItBit, Circle, which was funded by Goldman, uh, you see that here, uh, and then a variety of other companies. On the personal financial management, which is probably one of the areas that we see the most activity right now, 
Uh, we're seeing, you know, folks like Betterment, Motif, Wealthfront, etc. Uh, you know, the Betterment headline, I think, is particularly telling. Uh, you know, they've aligned with Fidelity um, to bring, quote unquote, financial advisors into the 21st century. Um, I think, you know, this idea of partnering, either partnering, acquiring, building, investing in these private companies is something that we're seeing increasingly um, happening more and more. And I think the Betterment Fidelity partnership underscores that. Uh, Wealthfront obviously has done a, a lot of work and now has two billion in client assets. The pace at which they've done it, which we'll show you in a few slides, is is pretty remarkable when you compare it to some of the traditional financial services players. So I think that's another important thing uh, to highlight. And then finally, on the lending side, lots of momentum here. Lots of companies emerging given the the, the some of the IPOs that have happened. So again, some of the companies that have kind of high momentum scores and high mosaic scores listed here. So that is some of the companies. So we've kind of started with overall fintech, uh, sort of unbundled that to some of the areas within fintech that we think, uh, based on smart money tracking, where the momentum is. And then as we peel it back even further, here are some of those companies that are even more interesting within those sub-segments. Um, there are, of course, hundreds of companies under these areas as well. So this is by no means an exhaustive list by any stretch, um, but uh, this is kind of some of the, the, the high flyers. Um, so we're going to take a look at some case studies. Um, where are financial services players placing their bets, right? And so I'm going to kind of go back to this theme I briefly touched upon earlier, which is allocation of resources is uh, is your strategy, right? So the best way to understand your competitor strategy is not to listen to what they say, but what they do, right? And I'd written a book kind of on this topic many years ago. Um, and so if you follow what your peers are investing in, what they're acquiring, who they're partnering with, their product and product development sort of roadmap, um, you get a really good data-driven insight into what their strategy is. I think most of the world does this by guessing or using their gut or even worse, relying on someone else's gut, i.e. consultants. Um, I think that is a fairly good way to be wrong. Uh, you may get lucky for, from time to time, but I think neither is ideal. So we're going to try to take a look at this again from a, a resource allocation being strategy perspective. Um, and we'll take a look at, to start, JP Morgan. Um, and so this is the network graph or the business social graph of JP Morgan. Um, and what you see here is kind of their connections to various no various areas, right? And so what's interesting is amongst those sort of four big categories for fintech investment, JPM has placed bets in personal financial management, in lending and in payments. They have completely not done anything in the digital currency kind of Bitcoin world. And so this is um, you know, one of the areas that they have sort of strategically said, at least by virtue of the fact of where they're investing, that they don't have uh, don't have any interest. Um, on the next slide, they've obviously made more than five bets, but here are some of the notable ones. I think what's worth highlighting is, one, the diversity of companies. So online broker tools to peer-to-peer -to -peer lending, to payments, to uh, small business cash, you know, kind of uh, alternative lending platforms. Um, so one, there's the diversity of the bets they're making. And two, it's also the stage uh, diversity, right? So they are investing at the Series B, which is still relatively early for companies, all the way through to the more growth round and they're also doing lines of credit and other things for these companies. So um, they have a lot of resources and so they're looking to bring to bear those resources in whatever way I think works for companies that, um, that make sense for, for JPM uh, in this particular case. Um, when we peel back Goldman, uh, we see Goldman actually, unlike JPM, is getting into Bitcoin. So they actually have placed... Um, uh, a bet or two in the in the digital currency kind of Bitcoin realm. And so you see that here on the social graph. What's interesting also is that these investors who are competitors, so JPM and Goldman, who are competitive peers, have actually co-invested in several companies together as well. So you see Motif and Square here. Um, Goldman got in later to Square, so not in the same round. Um, Circle is their Bitcoin bit, uh, bet, so it's a digital currency company. Um, and then you see kind of Perseus and Ken show, which are, uh, you know, uh, investments which are a little bit maybe closer to the core 
uh, Goldman business, right? Um, in Kensho, they did at a pretty early stage, Series A. So Goldman, um, if I go back to the earlier slide, is amongst the most prolific, probably the most prolific investor in uh, amongst the financial services firms. I would say probably across corporations in general, uh, maybe behind Goldman Sachs and Intel, uh, sorry, behind Google and Intel, uh, Goldman probably has uh, the most uh, frequent and active kind of investment uh, uh, activity. So, you know, definitely they are looking at uh, making lots of bets within the sort of startup realm. So if I shift gears a little bit um, from the banks to kind of the payment network. So here we're looking at the three big ones we've not put Discover on here. Uh, but Amex, MasterCard, and Visa, um, I think we see a few things. So in this case, we've mapped all their investments on a single social graph. And what you see, one is just the number of connections that Amex has. So they are doing a lot more investments. They have set up a separate delineated ventures unit, which helps. Um, so one, Amex is a lot more active. Um, Visa is the least. MasterCard kind of falls in the middle. Um, but what you actually see also is some difference in priorities, right? And so what you see is MasterCard um, has invested in um, mobile payments companies, mobile authentication verification companies are particularly interesting to them. Um, uh, MasterCard, it's not shown here, actually also invested in the NIMI wristband, which is a wearable company. So kind of them taking a bet on what's happening in wearable payments, which is an interesting play. Uh, Visa at the bottom of the of the table is the least active. Uh, you know, Square, Loop Pay, uh, Loop Pay, which which was actually acquired by Samsung for 250 million dollars earlier this year, and for integration into Samsung's mobile payment ecosystem. So I think it also underscores maybe the changing nature of the corporate minority investments or venture investments that these players are doing. It's not sort of a, a controlling type of interest. Um, and so when you see Lupe uh, get acquired by Samsung kind of underscores that. Amex is probably the most interesting one because they're making the most bets. Um, but from a strategic focus perspective, we see um, a lot of bets in international. Um, not surprising. I think it's always been, and even from my time at Amex, was also always an area that the company wanted to kind of fortify and bulk up its position, its international coverage. And then what Amex is doing that is probably the most different is their various consumer focus plays. So in line, I suppose, with their sort of high value card member focus, they're making bets in things that are very outside of the fintech realm or security realm, Warby Parker, Rent the Runway, um, Fancy, which is a Pinterest competitor, LearnVest, which was also, I think, recently acquired, um, are some of their bets. So, um, you know, different priorities, different um, level of activity within the private company realm. We see that uh, very clearly with regards to um, American Express. Uh, the next few slides, I won't spend time on. These are just kind of slightly more high-res versions of the of the business social graphs. So you can actually see the investments that uh, all three of these players have made. So I'm going to turn kind of to the final portion of the presentation, which is really about the pace of disruption um, and trying to underscore, I think, why those of you who are at large or even you know, small community banks. I think that's where we're seeing a lot of really interesting activity is some of the community banks who see an opportunity now to uh, to kind of take share, right? They're nimbler than maybe some of the large financial services players, but wanted to underscore, I think, why it's so important right now to move quickly. Um, by virtue of you being on this presentation um, and on this webinar, I'm going to assume that you're not sort of taking the first strategy, which we see some folks taking, which is the head and sand approach to dealing with innovation, startups, and threats. And I thought Brian Moynihan, the CEO of B of A, kind of made the sort of his comments at Q1 about robo advisor sort of typified this, right? Which was, you know, hey, they just, they're small ball. They deal with customers that aren't interesting to us. Um, you know, kind of the, the, the dismissal, and I'm not sure if this was posturing or if this was real, but this is sort of the head and sand approach to looking at what these threats might be. Um, the reason I think this is, uh, the reason that this is really not the right approach has been shown, and this is kind of the famous Clay Christensen disruptive innovation framework, which is take somebody like Wealthfront, um, you know, today in the opinion, I think, of many of the, the large wealth management firms, they have a low quality use case, right? It's millennials, folks without a lot of assets. Um, but what we see 
over and over across industries and you can look at eBay as a prior example you know eBay started off was dismissed as you know this fringe thing for people to exchange I think it was Beanie Babies and then over time it moved into really anything and everything automobiles and art so over time those things that are low quality use become their performance improves and they start to move upstream. There's no reason to believe that some of the emerging players, whether it's in payments or wealth management or otherwise, will not follow a similar trend. Um, so assuming you're not in the, the head in sand camp, um, kind of what's been interesting for us is sort of being on the other side of the table is uh, the folks who are interested in uh, what's happening within fintech. And I think when we started the company, you know, given our backgrounds, we thought, okay, M&A and investments would be the place. That makes a lot of sense. What we're seeing with financial services firms, those that are either acting out of fear or greed, um, you know, and both are, I guess, motivators, um, they're looking at it from a competitive intelligence perspective. What are our competitive peers doing? Who are our future peers? Um, kind of the stuff I showed you earlier with regards to uh, understanding the strategy of your peers. They're looking at it from obviously a strategy and innovation perspective. What are the emerging business models and companies and products and services out there that we should be looking at? Um, this ties in nicely to product development. So, um, you know, you can have a focus group and try to ask people or try to come up with ideas in your conference rooms. The other way to do product development is look at companies that are gaining traction and understand what is it about their product offerings that would indicate that that, um, that maybe are things that we should replicate. Maybe they're a company we should buy or invest in as well. So there's the product development use case. Marketing and partnerships make sense. You know, who should we be partnering with? So you have your, your Betterment Fidelity example or marketing messaging, right? So what is what are some of these companies with traction doing um, and what can we learn from them? And then finally, CTO and CIO offices. So who are the emerging vendors, the risks and emerging tech uh, that they should be keeping mindful of. So those are some of the use cases. Um, I kind of, you know, in tongue in cheek, talked about the head and sand use uh, kind of strategy. Of course, there's a lot of folks who are proactively readying themselves for what's next. Uh, Goldman put out a very provocative and interesting report about the disruption coming to financial services. They talked about $4.7 trillion in revenue being at risk of being displaced by these technology enabled entrants. And the last line or the last quote in this, pa the second paragraph is, you know, their expectation of partnerships, acquisitions, investments, or just, you know, people building uh, things that are own will be interesting as the vertical develops. We're seeing a lot of this. Um, JP Morgan Chase, Silicon Valley is coming. Jamie Dimon after the Q1 earnings kind of mentioned that in his letter. Um, I think one of the things to highlight is that Silicon Valley in this case, or at least in our opinion, is is less of a geography and more of a theme, right? And so it's more of a mindset. And so what you'll see in a, in a few slides is that all of this innovation is not coming just out of Cupertino and Mountain View and Palo Alto, but it's really coming um, from companies around the world. Why is it so important? Why have JPM, Goldman, Amex, Visa, MasterCard, and others kind of, why are they waking up to this? Or why are folks starting to worry about this? Why did 1,100 people sign up for this webinar? I think part of it is what everybody knows is that it's really hard to stay on top. So what got you here may not get you there. Um, and this chart is showing the lifespan of an S&P 500 company over time, and it is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And part of the reason for that is the disruption and, and uh, the changes that happen in markets um, incredibly quickly these days. Part of the reason for that disruption is because the threats are really multiplying at a pretty alarming rate. I think if you're, again, an incumbent financial services firm, this is, this is um, potentially scary or a really big opportunity. It is now cheaper than ever to build a startup. And what that means is there's just going to be more of them. They are producing at a prodigious rate right now. So what took $5 million in 2000 is now in 2011 was $5,000. And this is a great set of uh, data put together by our friends at Upfront Ventures. Um, and that's probably coming down even further, right? When you look at Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure and Google, all trying to make, you know, the cost of, of, of hosting and things even cheaper. I can see it for us as, a, as an emerging tech company ourselves benefiting from this. So um, the cost of launching a tech startup is going down. 
and that's manifesting itself in early stage activity. This is just seed angel and series A deals that we've tracked over the last seven years. And what we see is a very steady uptick in both deal and funding activity into the early stages, um, almost up 6x in terms of deals and close to that on funding as well. So there's just a lot more folks out there. There's a lot more players that you should be mindful of. Many of them, by virtue of the sort of law of startups, will fail. Um, but I think that is not, you know, as a, as a large financial services firm, not something you should take solace in because it's the few that survive and that thrive that create really sort of discontinuous, discontinuous problems for you. They're the ones who can grow very quickly and take a lot of market share very, very fast. Um, you know, we have a lot of companies forming and then the other force that sort of underlies this is that technology adoption is just getting quicker and quicker. So this is a really interesting graphic looking at the penetration of technology over time. Um, and so you have something like tele the telephone, which took a really long time to get to sort of 85% penetration. You have, a, you know, the, your uh, clothes washer, refrigerator, etc. And then when you move to the right of this, you see cell phone and internet. And just if you look at the cell phone curve, it is remarkable how quickly it's gotten to basically 90% penetration, right? So I think this is the speed part of innovation that is missed a lot, right? It's not just because stuff happens slower back some time ago, um, that doesn't mean it's going to continue that way. And so this pace is what is really, really, I think, the thing to keep an eye out on. And we see it very, if we bring it a little closer to home, look at Wealthfront versus Schwab. This is um, their ascent to a billion dollars under management. Um, Wealthfront did it in two years. Schwab took six. So you know, we see it really, really right here. Again, we can, if we want, discount these folks as targeting a group that we're not interested in or whatever it might be. But again, there's no denying that this ascent is rapid um, and more rapid than what could have been done in the past. So this brings me to a point, and I remember this very fondly from my days at Amex. We used to spend a lot of time talking about the, com the, com the competitive landscape, and it was often City or Cap One or Visa, Mastercard, etc. Uh, and I think those are that's you know something you have to do. Worry about what those competitors are doing. Um, I, the reality, though, is that really disruptive, discontinuous innovation is probably not coming from those large peers. There's going to be the odd one that will come up with something, but big companies, um, and I don't mean to offend anybody, are not oriented to do this type of innovation. I'm not the 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 incentive alignment organizational structure become difficult to do. So since that rarely comes from sort of your giant competitive peers, what, who you really need to watch out for is what you see on this next page. So it's these emerging peers, the ones that are easy to discount because they're, uh, you know, a handful of people with a little bit of funding, um, but really the new frontier on products, services, business models, technologies will be coming from them. And the other thing that this highlights is sort of this idea of death by a thousand cuts, which I'll, which we'll walk about, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So there's not going to be a startup that's coming after Goldman or City head on. That would be foolish. Um, it's a very difficult proposition. Um, these are highly diversified kind of financial services firms with hundreds of product offerings. So what we're actually seeing in this death by a thousand cuts kind of idea is the unbundling of financial services, right? So instead of it being uh, one company going after Wells Fargo, and this is just an example. Uh, we took Wells Fargo's website and basically deconstructed every product and service and looked at who are the startups attacking that very specific product or service. And so what we see here is um, instead of somebody going head off, uh, you know, right after Wells Fargo, people are building best in class offerings that target individual product and service offerings that Wells Fargo has. And this is, again, could be City, it could be Bank of America. We could have picked really any large bank's website and done this exact same exercise. So this is not um, specific to Wells Fargo by any stretch. Um, to my earlier point, um, you know, what we also see is that this isn't relegated just to U.S., right? So this is an example of a U.S. company with a number of, of U.S. startups, but 
uh, we can, and I'll show you in the next slide, that this applies just as much to European or even Asian uh, banks. And in the case of Wells Fargo, we see wealth front and betterment on the robo-advisor side. We see small business loan companies like OnDeck or Cabbage. Uh, and then we see small business service providers, Zen Payroll, Zenefit. So a lot of the things that Wells Fargo was hoping to offer to its clients, you know, are they better, are their clients better served by going to these best of breed um, kind of offerings. There's obviously a convenience loss there, but is that convenience loss offset by tools that are better and very purpose built for a specific problem? This is HSBC. So again, on the point of Europe, right? So now these are all European startups for the most part attacking uh, aspects of what HSBC's business model is. So, so here you see lending companies that those of you in the States may not be as familiar with, companies like Boro or Zopa or Ox Money, to wealth management companies like Nutmeg and eToro, money transfer companies like Azima, World Remit, TransferWise. So all attacking kind of various products and services of HSBC. So, um, you know, we have the pace of innovation is increasing, the cost of developing a startup is declining, which means a lot more threats. Um, and then finally, you kind of have, um, as a result, sort of uh, this innovation has sort of become ubiquitous. It's, it's in the valley, of course, in a big way, but it's really all over and people building very, um, you know, with a great deal of sort of clarity of purpose, building software and technologies that will disrupt very specific products and services at some of these incumbent banks, so, or financial services firms more broadly. So um, with that, um, I'm going to jump into questions. I know um, Mike on our team has been handling some of the questions and he's, gonna, he's picked some out for me that have come in. So I'll, I'll address them. Um, while Mike's getting those ready for me, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you want if you have questions, you want access to the underlying data. If you're an existing customer, please talk to your customer success manager. If you don't know who that is, email myself or Jonathan McKenna. Our details are here. If you're not a customer, reach out to me or sign up for a free trial account. Um, we have included some links, so just click on any of these links. These will take you to searches that are pre-made um, that kind of highlight some of the data that we use to develop this presentation. So there's some searches, some profiles, MasterCard, Amex, Visa, Goldman, JPM, and some of the companies as well. So just click on those URLs. Um, we'll send out the webinar uh, uh, recording as well as the PDF afterwards. So that is uh, right at the end. Um, and then... Um, you know, finally, just reach out to me if you have questions, of course. Um, so some of the questions that have come in, I'm going to try to answer some of these. So um, one of them that I think is quite good is um, what are some of the trends that we're seeing in fintech within emerging markets? Uh, so I think one of the big ones that we've noticed is remittances and money transfer. So the market is estimated to be kind of around $440 billion. Fees have been falling year over year consistently. Um, and two of the largest emerging players are in the UK. So we see World Remit uh, has raised, I think, about $150 million, $140 million in total, valued at about a half a billion transfer-wise, um, valued at just over a billion dollars. Um, you know, and as mobile transfers, especially in emerging markets where PC adoption is uh, less than you'd find in, in developed markets, um, you know, as mobile money transfer becomes really important because of mobile penetration, obviously. Um, I think the, uh, the remittance space is really interesting. You know, Western Union, really big target, $11 billion plus market cap, uh, MoneyGram, smaller, but also material company. Um, so I think that's one area. Payments, is also another area within the emerging markets. We're seeing a ton of innovation. I think there's actually some models that are in the emerging markets, which sort of get, which may, uh, which may see some life in, in the U.S. as well. Uh, banking, uh, you know, you have in emerging markets where the bank infrastructure, the the branch infrastructure, isn't what you have in sort of the states or in Europe. Uh, and so, how do you sort of skip uh, that whole uh, that whole sort of infrastructure? Um, and go right to, let's say, mobile banking. So I think that's a, another big area of uh, a focus within fintech. So great question. Um, let's see. Another question, uh, what areas do you see the most disruption today within fintech? So um, remittances, as I just discussed, so that's a big one. I think personal wealth management, so we've covered this quite a bit, um, you know, with the likes of Betterment and, and Wealthfront and others. Um, 
So this could mean robo-advisors like those folks um, who are going after Schwab and Vanguard and others, um, but it also is the millennial friendly savings companies like Digit, um, I think Acorn might be another one in that space. Uh, then you have folks like Motif, they allow investors to pick themes and buy a basket of pre-made stocks. So I think all these folks are trying to figure out ways to get younger people investing their money, um, getting them just into the market and then doing it in a more efficient, lightweight um, way that ultimately, you know, based on what they say, yields better returns as well, is a really interesting place. Um, you know, Goldman, in that same report I referenced earlier, said that, uh, you know, the millennial households already control $1 trillion in assets. So um, it is no, by no means a, a small market. Um, and so one that's going to be a big one. Uh, payments, obviously, is another big area. I think, you know, you got your stripes and ad yens of the world building tools that I think really work for, um, you know, riding to some degree a trend within e-commerce and mobile commerce, um, but then also just taking chances on Bitcoin and other things that, um you know, maybe the traditional financial services payments companies aren't going to do. Uh, you even have companies like Zora, uh, which is taking advantage of uh, subscription billing and looking at sort of the subscription economy, which is another area that we think is, is interesting. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of areas, I would say kind of any of the areas we highlighted, Bitcoin, payments, lending, there's a ton of innovation happening. Um, Wow, there's a lot of questions. All right, so uh, one of the other ones, uh, an area of fintech that causes some concern. So this one's a, it's a good question. I think since we started CB Insights, we've been hearing about a tech bubble for every, every year. So inevitably that will come true. Um, there's no doubt that things are a bit frothy right now, not just within fintech, but just tech overall. Um, I'd say one area that is is hot that may be, uh, you know, potentially a bit overheated is lending, um, and that specifically in China. So China's seen its person-to-person uh, -person loan market boom um, from 30 million in 2009 to just under a billion in 2012, and it's expected now to grow to almost 7 billion in 2015. So with that growth, there's been a lot of players entering the market, um, but there's also been multiple bankruptcies. So again, this may just be the natural sort of Darwinism of, of, startup, uh, of startups, and so many of them will fail, but there's just a lot of activity within Chinese lending companies. They've raised uh, over $300 million in equity financing since 2013. Um, some of the larger raises recently, there's Elon China or Elon CN and Ren Ren Dai, which both raised $100 million financings in, in 2014. Um, so I think that's a big area of, uh, it may be an area of concern, obviously a big opportunity there as well. So um, there may be some casualties inevitably. Um, so some other questions and we'll, we might not get to all of these, so we will um, maybe kind of put together a bit of a transcript and send that out afterwards, but there's a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so let me see. Are most fintech companies direct competition to banks or are fintech companies focusing on providing tech to current players with different gain share models? Um, so I think there is not one answer, there's not one single answer to this. I think there is um, some that are going to be enabling technologies for banks. Um, and then there's going to be some that are going very much directly after the, uh, the you know, the belly of the beast, um, like you might, you might say. So lending companies, the robo advisors, you know, they're not, uh, they might, they're partnering with in some instances, but they're really you know, trying to replace, I think, or change the paradigm of how uh, wealth management happens or how lending happens. Um, but of course, there's going to be folks that are providing uh, kind of the picks and shovels um, to financial services firms. And so I think we see companies like that. And we highlighted a couple of them earlier with Goldman, you know, Kensho was, was an example. Um, so people who are building tools for financial services firms, obviously financial services firms are huge buyers of technology. So, uh, you know, and so when you look at enterprise companies and the like, there's gonna be a lot of activity there. Um, let's see how, Crowded is the fintech space. Um, I think we kind of covered that. You know, there's there's a lot of new entrants coming. I think you know we're seeing uh, what was it? Almost 400 early stage companies just last year getting funding, and that's doesn't even put uh, 
that doesn't even consider kind of all of the fintech companies that are worth over a billion dollars today. So there's a lot of uh, a lot happening in fintech, uh, and that doesn't we take a pretty we take a pretty uh, kind of black and white definition or a line on what is fintech. So all the people who are selling into financial services as a community, as a customer set, we don't necessarily think of as fintech. Um, so things that are sort of more horizontal technologies that might have financial services as a client, but that might also serve as healthcare or others um, are also a big, big market. And that's not even considered in the $14 billion in funding that I highlighted earlier. So, um, but great, great question. Um, Crowdfunding. Um, so I didn't mention it. It's a, you know, uh, I think it's a relevant topic regarding fintech. So, um, yeah, I think absolutely. There's different models of crowdfunding, right? So there's, um, you have your Kickstarters and Indiegogos, which are not sort of equity kind of plays. Um, then you have, uh, uh, you know, AngelList and other folks that are doing things that are more uh, company for equity. Uh, I think there was one example, I think it was Funders Club that was invested in by Intel Capital. So, you know, a big market, I think, relative to maybe some of the other markets that are hot right now that have big funding, still more nascent, still a bit more unproven. Um, there's another company that's name is escaping me that does lending or does equity crowdfunding for sort of consumer packaged goods companies circle up. Um, so that's, you know, another area. So I think there's a lot of room to grow there. It hasn't, um, there hasn't been sort of that breakout company quite yet. Uh, you know, I think there's still, the verdict is out on how large, you know, how large is the demand to invest in all these fledgling companies? Um, I know as a somebody, as a company that's kind of doing startups all day long, you know, in the, in the sort of the echo chamber, it seems like it could be a big opportunity, but just outside of that, it's sort of to be determined how big it is. So, um, but I know we're wrapping up on our time. So I, I want to be mindful of that. Um, again, if you have questions, you see my info here, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, if you're a client, you know, and need help getting to all this underlying data, let me know. We'll figure out how to do that. If you're not a client, um, reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Um, but, you know, thanks again. We're seeing a lot of interest in this. We're going to be releasing some research briefs on the lending market and specifically some of the things we talked about with regards to China in the next few days. So um, be sure to track our, or be on our newsletter, cbinsights.com slash newsletter, or just check out our research blog, um, but again, thanks everybody for making the time and uh, uh, we'll send out the webinar and the presentation shortly thereafter. Thanks again.